Welcome to Conversations with Chamomile. This is your host, Jacob Lyles. Join me as we explore life together. Welcome back, everyone. Today, I have a guest who is part of an illustrious company of people that is PhD in philosophy dropouts. I have another friend who's a dropout of a PhD program in philosophy. He's a wonderful guy as well. Uh, John and I talk about his journey uh, through trying to find meaning in philosophy to ultimately figuring out that the only path forward in life for him was found in Christianity. Um, We also talk about various uh, ideas that Father Seraphim Rose uh, has about modern religion, especially the West's embrace of Eastern philosophy in modern times. Um, And John's very well versed in a lot of things. He's fascinating to talk to. I'll try to put some links on the YouTube channel uh, um, that skip to various parts of the conversation. If you aren't so interested in the philosophical discussion and want to hear more about uh, what he has to say about what he's discovered in Christianity, I I think uh, all of it is very good but i want to help you index into the conversation where you can i might list some clips out of this one because it was just very tasty um and uh just a reminder if you are listening to me on apple podcast you can listen to me on youtube and follow me there and if you're following me on youtube you can also follow me on apple podcast and maybe leave a good review if you're enjoying these conversations uh so without any further introduction here is john Badiali. Well, welcome, John, to the podcast. Uh, just to let you know, uh, the name of the podcast, by the way, I don't think I told you, is Conversations with Chamomile. Um, so welcome to Conversations with Chamomile. Are you Chamomile? Uh, yeah, I can be. It's a nickname. Uh, but I also like the tea a lot. Uh, I don't have any made up right now, but I often oh, do, okay, gotcha. do drink some. Um, would you mind, uh, maybe we should start with uh, an introduction. Um, uh you know, who you are, what, what you're interested in, um, stuff like that. Sure. Yeah. I'm a, uh, currently I'm a, you know, I'm a software developer. I went to, uh, I studied philosophy in school. Um, and the long story short of that is, uh, went to grad school, did that thing for a while, learned that it wasn't going where I wanted it to go, left, went into the real world, bounced around different jobs because, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to get it job related to uh, philosophy sort of in the job market. So bounced around until settling on uh, programming as a pragmatic thing. Um, And then never totally stopped reading or studying and writing and that sort of thing. Um, So I mean, in general, that's basically, basically it. My focus in uh, school was on Heidegger. So that's sort of my strongest area though. I studied, it was in the continental tradition. so I had to go through the history of philosophy and the ancients and stuff like that. So as a fan, while well, still kind of a fan of Aristotle and, you know, some other stuff along those lines. Oh, so that was a philosophy grad school uh, program that you dropped out of? Yeah. Yeah. I made it through master's uh, program and then uh, didn't continue with the PhD because I, by that time I became disillusioned and yeah. was like, you know, it's not worth it. My, my uh, vague opinion about philosophy grad school is that, getting slogging through to the end of the phd is probably uh the the the, the cost benefit calculation is, is 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 not great yeah i knew a lot of phd students who were my fellow students and saw what they went through and i was like you know i don't i don't know if this is worth yeah worth all that time so um and, and so so this this series is on people making the journey to some religious faith as, as an adult and um, so I'm curious, like, how would you describe yourself spiritually at this moment? Um, I hesitate to, uh, I say, I, would, I guess I would say broadly Christian, but I don't have, um, I don't want to say that because that means different things to different people. And since I'm not actually officially part of any church at this point, I don't want to make any claim to that. Uh, but yeah, i, I I believe, you know, Jesus Christ, the son of God, and, uh, you know, that sort of nice and creed at the basics, also, I would say. 
So it's kind of, uh, yeah, I, I think the, uh, a lot of people, there's different ways to, to define Christianity for sure. And like one of them, a very traditional way would be to say like, uh, can you recite the Nicene Creed uh, and agree with it? Um, like without reservations. Um, so that kind of puts you, uh, from, from my point of view, like it puts you kind of like in the center of uh, sort of standard Christianity. Uh, yeah, well, it depends on who you ask. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I've been exploring a lot the uh, East-West schism and division. Mm. Um, oh, cool. uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I was raised Catholic or mm. Roman Catholic, uh, up to a point and then dropped off and became, you know, a secular sort of semi-materialist until I got into Gnosticism, uh, mm. and then fortunately got out of that before yeah. it, uh, destroyed my soul. Well, we'll, we'll we, sh we should definitely dive into that in a little bit of detail for, yeah, I, you're not the first person that to really fall in love with, I think, Gnosticism, maybe for the mystique of it. Um, my, myself, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm a three-year Orthodox Christian now, so I, I, uh, I'm sort of aware of the East-West divide and, and thinking and uh, perspective in a way that I think most people, most Christians that I'm surrounded by don't really know that that's a thing, uh, that there's such a strong difference in the, in the flavor um, and approach, uh, between the East and the West. Um, but I, I kind of fell in love with the East, so that's who I am. Um, and I was, a, I was a Buddhist before I was a Christian. So I think there's like some sort of bias towards like loving the East that I probably had. Uh, yeah, well, it seems, uh, one of the distinctions seems to be that the, the West is much more intellectual then uh, the, the East is more, I guess, broadly spiritual, at least ascetic sort of oriented than the Roman Catholic Church with its, you know, Aquinas being the uh, sort of one pinnacle theologians. Yeah, but, the, the, uh, there's like a way that, that Catholics talk, which is strange to me, which is uh, they, they like have a lot of definitions and like specificity in their faith. Uh, whereas like, I think the Eastern the east likes to veil things a little more uh because uh, as a um and like leave things undefined uh and, and that sort of reflects our relationship with the like the un ultimately unknowable ineffable god um and uh, so so there's there's definitely that people call the east a lot of times like mystical um and, and the west feels more philosophical if i was going to put a like a label on it um, but we can get into that maybe some at the end. Let's uh, go ahead and jump into your story a bit. I, I want to know, uh, like, what was your spiritual upbringing? Like, how did you start off? Um, yeah, I mean, I was raised Catholic up to a point until maybe age, I don't know, 13, I guess, broadly speaking, sometime around the beginning of high school, I kind of faded away. Uh, from that or just started exploring philosophy. Uh, I was always kind of driven to uh, know what, try and figure out the meaning of the universe was basically. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, read a bit about the Greek, ancient Greek philosophers. And then I got into Nietzsche and Jung, Carl Jung, and that really kind of guided me up until the point that I uh, met a professor in college who introduced me to Heidegger, my, Martin Heidegger's work. And then that kind of took over for a bit and I tried to synthesize uh, Heidegger and Jung to some degree. And that's kind of like an undeveloped thesis. I did, did some papers on it, but never totally worked it out. Um, and also in college, I started getting into uh, Kabbalah and things like that, uh, which I was rather taken with because it, uh, it seemed to, to, to promise a kind of experiential dimension to, um, to spirituality because I never really bought materialism at, at, or like yes, like metaphysical materialism as in there's only matter and that's it. That just seemed, that always seemed kind of ridiculous to me. There's just dimensions of life that clearly are immaterial, like human beings or conversations or logic, things like that are, you know, clearly not material substances. And so I kind of, uh, that was guiding my thought to to a great degree and I got into Spinoza and stuff like this and pantheistic sort of ideas and kind of developed this I don't know 
broadly Gnostic uh, pantheist type everything is God. How do we know God by knowing everything uh, or by, be, be, I don't know. That's a, the whole Gnosticism thing is a, is a, is a big topic, but yeah, I, 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 I dabbled in that for, for quite a while. Um, well, let's, uh, let's, let's um, take some of those, unpack some of those steps a little bit. Um, so like when you were raised Catholic, did, did you go to, were you catechized? Were you uh, brought to Catholic schools? Like what, what level yeah. of Catholicism, like were you presented with? Um, I did, I guess it was like CCD or something like that for uh, up until getting communion and I was never confirmed. Mm. So whatever level that that is, I don't know that I was fully catechized. Uh, I honestly, I don't remember. I remember mm. going to CCD and various things about that and uh, yeah, taking communion and you know, when I was very young, thinking, getting confused and asking, asking my mom if the uh, the priest was God and was told that it wasn't, the priest was not God. And, uh, you know, I don't know, that was a formative experience for me. So I was like, oh, it's, uh, it's God's not somebody I can meet at church mm. or in my childish, you know, mind. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, that's, that's about as far as I got was c communion. Were, were your parents like seriously Catholic? Uh, one of them, yes. The other one, no, not so much. Okay. And so when you stopped going to mass, you said that was like in the teenage years, you kind of like fell away from that and started doing, uh, getting more into philosophy. Uh, and, uh, like what did your parents have thoughts about you? Like not going to mass anymore? Well, it started actually with us, not uh, none of us going to mass, but going to sort of like, I guess, Protestant type non non-nominational churches um after a big move uh in our lives uh like physical like different state sort of thing um and so i don't know why that happened and uh that's certainly didn't uh, satisfy me uh spiritually um and then one of my parents just stopped going and, or like one of my parents stopped going first and then both of them stopped going and then um at some point i was given the option to go or not go and I didn't go because I was a teenager and I, you know, knew better. Hmm. Um, so, so, yeah. So how are and at the same time you were getting into uh, philosophy and, and, in school? Yeah. Well, not in school. I, I was a, uh, yeah, I, I, mean, guess, a I guess they don't teach own. philosophy in high school very much. You know? No, uh, no, I, yeah, I kind of got in a, into it on my own through uh, my father's library where there's, you know, like Jung and Nietzsche were in there. And so I picked those up and I got into uh, the way of the samurai with the Hagakure. Um, and so I was like, and then Zen a little bit and that sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, I just did a lot of independent reading uh, in that direction. Sounds like you're a pretty uh, voracious reader. I was, yeah. Well, and still am, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of philosophy uh, kind of caught your interest the most? Uh, you, you, you mentioned you were always like on a quest to know the true nature of the universe or something like that, or the truth. Yeah, of the meaning universe. of life, you know, that sort meaning of, of life. Uh, was that like on your mind as a teenager? Uh, very much so. I mean, I struggled a lot with um, like depression and now what I recognize is, well, I recognize it then as nihilism, but uh, as kind of like the, sort of overarching theme of my, uh, I guess, philosophical and spiritual investigations. Um, as I, like reading Nietzsche and stuff like that, I became very uh, dis d troubled by the idea of uh, totally self-willing things and like choosing or making meaning in the world or choosing meaning and stuff like that. The principal problem seeing, seeming to me to be well, if I have to choose my own meaning, then any meaning I choose is by definition arbitrary and therefore not meaningful. The presupposition is that there's nothing meaningful. If I have to choose it, then it must not be meaningful <laughs> in, in itself. Um, it's interesting that like everyone I talked to that went through a nihilist phase, like seems to have been really depressed at that time. <laughs> Nihilism is pretty depressing, man. I don't yeah. know. Like there's, there's like, it's almost solipsistic, right? Like you don't have a relationship to something outside of yourself. Um, if you're like making your own meaning, if that's, if that's all there is. 
yeah, and it's hard to even uh, relate to other people um, at, at a certain point. So of, what, um, yeah. what was nihilism something you were seriously struggling with as a teenager? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, it wasn't helped by the fact that, you know, I was thinking about these things and n nobody else around me was, you know, uh, like, you know, m most people, you know, like getting drunk and doing s stuff like that. Um, not that I didn't get pulled into some of that, but it, I wasn't able to just be like, oh, you know, let's go to party. And that's that's what life is. You know, it's just a party and we're going to yeah, work and party, work and party. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if you don't, just struggling if you, with it. If you don't look too closely at it, maybe the, uh, maybe the, uh, existential crisis can, uh, be put off for a while. It certainly can. Yeah. Um, so did, did that nihilist phase like last you through high school, like to college or, uh, like w when did it, when did it end or when did you find something that other than nihilism to be, uh, or when did you find something that would like replace the nihilism? I think um, ultimately it wasn't until very recently and uh, found my way back to Christianity, um, the real actual end point of it. There was a temporary seeming reprieve in um, studying, uh, yeah, the, the well, like Kabbalah and then it sort of, and then German romanticism broadly, mm -hmm. this sort of, um, you know, like, magic almost like there's there's some kind of spiritual realm or something beyond and there's inspiration and genius and whatever and i got pretty into like goethe and um hmm. uh, what do we call it? vitalism i guess some stuff along those lines uh until i realized that that ultimately led to the same abyss or didn't actually solve the problem um because then uh, yeah i mean that's more more or less and i read I had a project that was kind of what I was originally going to do. And when I came on to Indie Thinkers of trying to figure out how to solve nihilism through like some kind of like creative work or something like that. But then comes the choice of, you know, well, what work do I choose? And there's this kind of uh, waiting for something to, to, to inspire you to, or to give you a direction. Because um, if that problem of, well, if I choose it, then it's arbitrary. I kind of can't choose it myself. It has to somehow be given. And so then it becomes, okay, well, where is it coming from? Uh, is that a tenet of like German romanticism that like there's some sort of like genius or some sort of mind, something that like comes to you? Like there's something transcendent, but it's, it, it's like intuition or something. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on German romanticism and I'm kind of using that as a catch-all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm most familiar with Nietzsche and Heidegger, uh, which people, Heidegger probably wouldn't call himself a German romantic, but I think that streak is strong in him. And it certainly is, I think in Nietzsche of, um, you know, this idea of, uh, yeah, like there's, I think like automatic writing was a big thing. Like, uh, what's this? Uh, actually, huh. Goethe talks a lot about like genius, but also these sort of like guiding principles of things that unfold in reality uh, that are behind things uh, like vital principles, basically, of the, of the universe that uh, yeah unfold and you kind of tap into that or make yourself receptive to those things or hmm. or, or whatever. Um, and I've become very, very wary of that now after uh, my recent explorations. But uh, the sort of basic conclusion that I ran into is that humanity is not sufficient on its own to give itself a purpose. And so I was seeking down this sort of esoteric spiritualism sort of thing for some kind of uh, otherworldly thing to give that to, to, to me, basically. So, so you're like trying to tap into some sort of world uh, some sort of spirit or sort of uh energy of some sort um and, like automatic writing that's just like is that just like writing without stop like uh, like uh sort of intuitive writing um my understanding is that it's almost like they probably wouldn't call it demonic possession but it's something like where like you're writing but it's not you writing like mm -hmm. you're kind of just your hand is taken over so to speak by something else that's not you um was was goethe a christian um i don't know what he called himself I, my impression is that he isn't in any meaningful sense because i i'm pretty sure that any 
Christian tradition that I know of would label him a heretic at the least, okay. if not an outright apostate. Uh, so, so at least extremely creatively Christian in a way that maybe was like outside the, the bounds of sort of standard Christianity. Yeah, well, he, he seems to be kind of pantheistic, which a lot of that stuff is where you have, you know, existence is sort of broadly speaking, one substance unfolding according to certain definite principles. And there's no, hmm. there's no transcending God. Like, already um inherently and and totally that sounds um, really hindu father sarah from rose orthodoxy and the religion of the future uh mm. goes into all that kind of stuff but yeah huh. it all starts looking very similar after a certain after a certain point gnosticism hinduism german romanticism and i mean schopenhauer's exemplary you know he explicitly got into Hinduism, I forget what it was, if it was Vedanta or something else like that. And that, like, one of the basis of his whole philosophy. And Nietzsche's a student of him. And it's all kind of there in the background, maybe. Okay. So you mentioned kind of like three, uh, three intellectual influences. Um, you mentioned, uh, like, there's like a pantheism, a Kabbalah, and uh, Heidegger. Uh, which one of those did you encounter first? Probably it was either Kabbalah or Heidegger. I encountered them both kind of at the same time. And I discovered Spinoza later. And Spinoza, when I say pantheism, I'm basically using Spinoza as my sort of point of reference. Well, Spinozan pantheism, shall we say? Um, so the uh, Kabbalah and Heidegger, that's that's quite a brew. How did you uh, how did you react to those like when you when you encountered them? Well, I kind of had taken Heidegger as a starting point, so maybe I got to that first. Hmm. Um, and then Heidegger, like using being in time, really. Um, and Heidegger talks about uh, base, the sort of uh, state, or not a, it's not a state, but uh, existential, uh, maybe it's a mood. I think it's a mood or attunement or something like that, a resoluteness mm -hmm. where you kind of come to yourself and you cease your inauthentic, inauthentic way of being uh, and become like authentic and, you know, in view of your own death, basically. Um, and what I was thinking was, okay, well, uh, you know, Kabbalah has this sort of systematic meditation and, that will, can supposedly lead you to the divine realms or whatever. And while that seems to be true, or let me assume that it's true, um, and then Heidegger says this, maybe you get to a state of resoluteness and, you know, affirming your death or something like that. And from there, you can do the meditation. Like the meditation presupposes that you're like authentically present, I guess, um, and not a wash or something like that. I, that was my working thesis. I never really developed it, but that's kind of where I was going. Yeah. Now, um, were, did you have anyone else that, um, that was doing this kind of stuff with you? Like, did you have friends that were in Kabbalah or is this like all individual, like you reading books and you uh, taking on these practices? Uh, it was pretty much me. I mean, I had a professor that was effectively a tutor on Heidegger, but not on um, Kabbalah. That was pretty independent uh, sort of thing, though I had friends around who were interested in, you know, uh, like shamanism and the other kind of spiritual or spiritistic sort of things, but not Kabbalah in particular. Hmm. And uh, so, I don't know, in the, I, I come from San Francisco and whenever, whenever anyone says shamanism, I, I hear psychedelia. Um, is it that or is it more uh, like just primitive religion in general? Uh, both. Like shaman as witch doctor as pharmacon or, or pharmacist or whatever sort of thing. I see. Um, so how, how long did you uh, like pursue the this path of Heidegger plus Kabbalah? Uh, I kind of dropped off Kabbalah after I taught. Co coincidentally, spoke to a Catholic priest, even though I wasn't didn't I didn't consider myself Christian at that time, but he was a. Uh, substantial Heidegger scholar, uh, to say the least, he's very um, well reputed, let's say. And so I spoke to him about Heidegger in particular, but I've mentioned experiences I had had doing Kabbalah because I found, you know, like, oh, if I do these meditations, it actually did what it said it was going to do. Um, and I mentioned it to him and he's coming from a Heideggerian perspective. He was basic. He basically said, well, that's escapism. And what you need to do is be here, like in this you know, present in this reality, not to escaping to some otherworldly reality. 
And I was like, okay, that's, that makes sense. I get that. So I just kind of dropped it off. Uh, and my thinking went along more of it, it, the um, sort of, yeah, the sort of Goethe type line of uh, Goethe and other, uh, sorry, it's been a little, little while. The sort of, I had studied Paul Clay actually for a bit. Um, and he talks about making the invisible visible. And so I started going down that and it's like, okay, well, how can I make invisible things, visible things? How can I communicate the inner principles of things of nature in particular, uh, the invisible things, things that aren't knowable through empirical science, but only through, I guess, like an intuitive vision or something like that. Um, and so I kind of let Kabbalah go from like some like meditation sort of thing to a rather, I don't know, attempted some kind of artistic vision or something like that. So there's um there, there seems to be a thread of like wanting to have a uh, direct experience or participatory knowing of truth. Um, like, cause you're, you're taking on, you're not just reading books or like analytical philosophy, but you're, you're also getting into like meditation and artistic endeavors and like an attempt to know or participate in the, the the truth that you're looking for yeah definitely i mean i was kind of under the hypothesis i guess that art could be a way of knowing basically hmm. in contrast to science and in some sense i think that's still kind of true in a, in a basic sense of learning a skill grants you a kind of knowledge of the world that's not given by a sort of uh, detached um, experimental method if you learn how to build a house, you know, there's knowledge in that that's not available through just experimentation. It's just a different kind of knowledge. But I was thinking of art as a way of like scientific knowledge, You're trying to put those two things together. It's con contemplative knowledge. Art is a way of contem con contemplative knowledge, I guess. Mm. So is there any, um, what do you think about the relationship between Heiger and Christianity? Like, is there compatibilities there? Or do you take anything like, do you still take anything with you? Uh, from Heidegger, or uh, or is that like something you've? Um, act, yeah, I'm actively struggling with that actually. Because um, initially, I thought there was. I read some papers I found about how Heidegger, on, on the one hand, was Catholic for a time, then became Lutheran, and then just anti-Christianity in general. Um, but his apparently his er, some of his early works or early thoughts were definitely influenced by the Christian idea of the, of the human person, but he goes beyond it. And it's there's some things that are that are crossovers. It almost feels at, at times like he's trying to reconstruct or redetermine human existence in without the Christian categories or without particularly without sin and without God. I think a lot of it fits or, or can be, you, you know, roughly is roughly compatible, but there's certain commitments in his thought that are explicitly atheistic and um, I would say nihilistic, but also, you know, he really doesn't want to have sin. Like he has this idea of fallenness um, as a category of human existence uh, where you could be authentic or inauthentic and you fall away from your authenticity or not um as a kind of like erring or whatever and mm -hmm. you know people you know christians might be familiar with the idea of sin as amartya in the greek you know it's missing the mark or whatever um and it sounds a lot like sin but without the sort of without without a lot of it without the dimension of it being sin you know mm -hmm. falling away from god or going awry in a spiritual sense and without any kind of ontological permanence, say, like you have, you know, that you you commit sins and you have to go to confession in order to, you know, have them remitted. It's like fallenness is just sort of just going back and forth with no particular significance as to either one of them, such that it becomes unclear whether or not authenticity is actually better than an authenticity or why would one want to be one or the other. And what I keep hearing is that, well, you don't actually choose to be authentic or inauthentic like Sartre would talk about with bad good faith bad faith but rather it kind of just happens to you or not hmm. yeah and if it's just right. happening to you it's not really clear why you should care about that particular distinction <laughs> it's at not, all no it's not clear yeah. yeah i mean speaking from like a modern uh contemporary um culture like you know the idea of authenticity is held in high regard um as having more 
being more lively or having more flavor or being more enjoyable or certainly having higher social status, like to be authentic. Um, but I don't know if that's like the same kind of authenticity that Heidegger. No, really that is very about. different. I, I would think that what passes for authenticity now would count as inauthenticity in Heideggerian terms <laughs> in most cases, I would think. Fascinating. Um, so, uh, so you have this Heideggerian foundation, you go through this Kabbalah phase, uh, and, and, uh, th then we come to like pan pantheism. Like what, what did that phase of your life, how did you try to enact pantheism? Um, well, I guess, it, I don't know if I tried to enact it so much. Well, I guess I kind of did. So I discovered Spinoza, I guess, in grad school, um, and really, and read Spinoza's ethics and found it to be to essentially solve the mind body problem, basically. Like he kind of neatly solves that issue by just saying, you, you know, God is one substance and mind and body are two attributes of one substance, hmm. basically. And you can kind of look at them under different aspects. And uh, so the mind body problem is just how the mind and the body relate because, like, mind is phenomena and body is matter. Well, it's it's almost as if it's both. It's just both or like body and mind are just two ways of looking at the same thing effectively. Mm -hmm. so, more That's not exactly correct, but roughly speaking. Um, so I, I, there's a word for this in modern usage, like of like brain, like brain versus consciousness, uh, where they're mm -hmm. kind of just taken as the same. Yeah, I think sometimes people talk about like dualism or you know my, my or it's like consciousness as being I, i'm familiar that like the the study of like what is consciousness and like people having different opinions on that is is a different is like a branch of philosophy right so some people say consciousness is separate from from the brain uh, like those are two different things others say that consciousness is doesn't isn't actually there um although uh you know it's the brain is all there is um and then other people would say that consciousness is primary and like we only know the brain through our conscious experience of people telling us about the brain or us poking at a brain um so i i'm kind of familiar with like these philosophical questions but not in any sort of professional way yeah i mean those are real real questions that people ask that kind of fall out of cartesianism uh, or descartes the cartesian dualism and i think it, it, what spinoza why spinoza appealed to me is because it seemed to me to resolve that issue by basically saying there's not two substances there's not a mind substance and a body substance or consciousness and matter there's just one substance which is everything which is god and it's experienced in different ways and it's there's god has infinite attributes and it's infinite everything basically forever and in that sense it's kind of actually like hinduism and that's where that sort of parallel comes in where there's some ultimate ineffable unknowable infinite everything that mm -hmm. one participates in some finite finite amount or in some finite way at any given time uh such that insofar as uh, reality is god or everything is 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 god not 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 the true god in my estimation but uh everybody's divine because everybody's part of you know this divine substance basically yeah so, so you get to have your cake and eat it too you don't have to do anything you're just born god already yeah there's nothing to do you just have to realize how awesome you are in the first place and it's kind of like it reminds me a lot of like the the you know i was kind of in the neo-hippie culture in the bay area for a while and uh, around a lot of psychedelia and there's this feeling of uh, probably the dominant, this is probably the dominant spiritual paradigm that people use, like all is one. Um, you're perfect already. Um, there's nothing you need to do. Um, just realize, you just need to realize that there's nothing you need to realize um, and uh, be at peace. Um, and uh, I, I, I just suppose that uh, I never could really believe it. And, uh, and I found it not to be a satisfying um solution and i didn't like the people that were satisfied with it um so that, that was kind of but I, I think a lot of that influence i'm not sure if it's coming from spinoza as much as it is coming from the east more um or or like the hindu mentality uh probably 
Yeah, I, I don't know if it's, I, I mean, I think in modern culture, Spinoza didn't have that much of an influence directly. Um, he, well, Nietzsche apparently in a, one of his letters says that re, when he discovers Spinoza, he says, oh, I had a predecessor I didn't realize. You know, hmm. so there's some kind of connection there, which I think that's a topic for another day. But I think the sort of underlying thoughts are the same, even if they didn't originate in the same space physical space say like it did spinoza didn't come out of india and as far as i know he didn't study hinduism but he reaches a somewhat similar con conclusion um yeah, yeah. maybe there's just like a finite set of conclusions about um what uh really exists like it, there seems to be a couple of like only a, only a small set of like distinct choices i mean i i kind of I'm starting to think there's just two choices. There's a uh, knowledge or faith um, where the common element between Spinoza and say Hinduism is that, and or Buddhism for that matter, is that the, the difference between like being in a good way or a bad way is, is knowledge or your own awareness of your, of your situation. And, you know, and the Eastern stuff, you deconstruct your desires or learn to uh, set them aside and then you can know the ultimate internet, whatever. Whereas in Spinoza, it's actually kind of similar. He has a whole thing in the ethics about uh, the passions and how to attain freedom uh, from the, from the passions. And by doing that, you realize the ultimate substance basically and become it's effectively like your your will becomes uh, one with God, but God's not a person mm. uh, sort of thing. It's like you, you it's kind of it's kind of weird. It's a little bit different. But the sort of uh, salient thing is knowledge through some kind of rational, more or less means or gnosis. And this is I mean, that's my understanding. That's the sort of thing with Gnosticism is you attain the good ultimate good reality by realizing that this one's you know an illusion or something like that you learn you learn something it's through some kind of enlightenment mm -hmm. okay. so um what was it like to be a pantheist why yeah oh it's well it's great until you realize it's empty um because mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want and you know it's about uh it's ultimately hedonism i mean i think that's the, the natural end conclusion of it uh where it's about feeling feeling good and feeling at one with the universe and whatever. And if drugs help you with that, great, but that's unreliable. So then you have to practice, you know, so that you can always feel like this is the best of all possible times, you know, and I'm in sync with the universe and uh, whatever. And you get a high feeling, you know, but um, it's not ultimately spiritually satisfying, I don't think. And it doesn't mesh very well with everyday life. And uh you know, when you have to go to a job that you that you don't like, or you know, or that's pretty miserable, um, it doesn't really help with that at all. Uh, it might even exacerbate it because then you're like, oh, but I know that there's all this stuff that's way more meaningful than this, but I have to go work this stupid, crappy job. This is all lies and illusion, which is itself kind of partially true, but it doesn't really give you any kind of way to deal with that, other than just waiting till the weekend or whatever to go escape into you know div divine land or whatever hmm. yeah so, so it, it sounds like it's not very good at like coping with suffering <laughs> no it's not <laughs> and, and like and, you know in, in, the, in the hippie spheres i ran in where everyone was like a uh, hindu without knowing it it was like you know these these are very blessed people mostly right like they're you know they make good money came from good families have a lot of free time um you know, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, the, the buzzword people say nowadays is privilege. And like, I don't know that you'll ha find like more privilege than you will at Spirit Rock um, or Esalen uh, than like most other places in the country. Um, and uh, like when you when you I do think there's something about like suffering and becoming and finding a genuine spiritual path. Like those those two things kind of go together. But you need to find oh. something better than su like that's strong enough to stand up to suffering. Yeah, that's, I agree. I think, and that's part of why I guess Christianity appeals to me is because unlike anything else that I know of, it actually deals with suffering and affirms it. Um, and I think the turning point for me was recognizing that um, the, the life of Christ, even if you interpret it in purely human terms and what was accomplished on the cross, even if you totally separate out all the other 
stuff, which is, I think, significant. There's a refutation of the sort of worldly logic of life is only worth living if I get what I want. Hmm. Um, and in that sense, it's, an, it's a profound affirmation of life, even or perhaps especially in suffering, which is absent from the other traditions, as far as I know. Like in Buddhism, you're trying to you're trying to get away from suffering, you know, and, and Gnosticism is very aggressive about that. Like material reality sucks. It's an illusion because it's painful, you know, and whatever. And we have to get to the pure place where there's no suffering and uh, there's no good. Suffering is evil. You know, suffering is bad. It needs to be avoided or, or realized to be an illusion or, or, or whatever. Um, yeah, that's really it's, that's really well put. Um, and and it, I think it really shows and. Yeah, Christianity's affirming of life, like, like uh, even um, like one thing that's really touching I find is how uh, like children with disabilities or adults with disabilities are um, are sort of like uh, accepted into the parish life, and like um, like a Christian parent who has a disabled child uh, like views that as a, you know it's like a holy mission from God to raise a disabled child and to care for them and to give them the best possible life that you can have. And it's not clear. That's a very bizarre thing to think. Um, like there's a lot of different perspectives that you can take on that. But for a Christian, like the disabled child is also uh, a ch child of God um, and that is loved by God and, you know, deserves to um, have a, have a, a, a normal a human life um, as much as anyone else. Um, and uh, yeah, you won't find that in materialism for sure. Um, no, um, I mean it seems to be un unconditional uh, mm. in, in a certain sense. Like, they're, like all, life itself is good and is a gift of God, even if it's you know in some kind of crappy circumstance or there's something difficult or painful. Uh, yeah, like with the cross being like you know the the prototype. Um, like it was a very painful thing, but worth it. Like it was, it was good that. Christ lived in, 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 even though his life was very hard. Um, so I, I do, the Gnosticism you ran into, is that Christian Gnosticism or is that some, a broader term? Uh, um, I mostly was into, uh, into Kabbalah. I mean, I mm -hmm. looked at like the gospel of Thomas and stuff like that. And Young, who is, uh, I wouldn't call him Christian, but uh, he was definitely very into the Christian Gnostic uh, uh tradition i guess um but gnosticism in my understanding from what i've been reading lately is uh broadly it existed it predated christianity and postdated it and then it kind of they tried to make a christian version of it which was not very christian but also but very gnostic i guess mm. and uh so how did you eventually like encounter christianity like what was that process like um, I suppose in a nutshell, it was a couple of things. Like I'd struggled with uh, despair, I would say, for, for some time and struggled with thoughts of suicide and stuff like that. And I, I eventually reached a point where I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. I can't because it'll hurt people that I care about. So uh, that's fine. That stopped me from that. And I, but then I started to be like, well, what if they die, you know, and they're not here, then what's to stop me? And so it's like, OK, I bought bought myself some time, uh, so to speak. And I eventually just resolved myself. Like, I'm, I'm just not going to commit suicide. I'm just not going to do it. It doesn't matter. I'm going to deal with it. But I would keep hitting a low point and hitting and despairing periodically. And over the course of 2020, for various reasons, that became very frequent. And I was reached a you know, low point. And I was like, I reached this point again. I promised I would never get here again. But here I am again. Some, I have to find a solution to this. Something has to, to something has to change. Um, and the other, on, on the other hand, there's a recognition I feel like of what's been going on in the world that uh, evil is real. Basically, like there's stuff that I am uh, completely incapable of explaining by any rational sense. Um, to the to the point where I basically started reasoning like along the lines of, well, Satan's clearly real. And if Satan's real, then God must be real. Hmm. Now, there's kind of an implicit faith there already, but it seemed clear to me that there's there's evil out there that just it can't be explained by rational or natural means. Hmm. Um, 
humans do things that other that no other animals do. And if we're just animals, then you got to explain that specific difference and why we do these things that make no sense from the standpoint of survival of the species or, or things like that. It's completely, it, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it strikes me as like trying to go through 2020 and being a pantheist, uh, it would strike me as like very bizarre. It's like you have to see like like all this like violence and conflict breaking out and think like, you know, this is like all God doing it to himself for fun. It's like, it doesn't seem very satisfying uh, of an answer. So I think the challenging thing would be that you, from that perspective, you would have to affirm it uh, just purely as it is without any reason. Like it's not, like it's not even like, oh, it's the will of God and there's divine providence or something like that. It's just, no, this is what's happening. And if it happens, it's it's good because there is no good and evil ultimately, or evil is an illusion. Um, but but it, it seems like you, you had like a pretty powerful intuition that like evil actually did exist. Um, yeah, there's certain things that I can't accept. It's like, there's no way that, and if it, if going beyond good and evil requires me to accept certain things as acceptable, then I, I can't do that. And I will be a, you know, a, be a moralist or whatever you want to call somebody who, you know, yeah, it's, asserts it's almost, that, there's, that there is good and evil. It's almost, um, yeah, it's almost uh, not cool to believe in good and evil, but that's not quite right. Like, I think our world um, actually is kind of like the post-Christian world is, shaped by Christianity in a way that it's not quite nihilist. Uh, it does believe in good and evil, just sometimes a distorted version of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but my impression is it looks like Antichrist to me. Um, yeah. It's like, an, it's like a weird inversion or perversion of Christianity that looks kind of like it in the superficial way. But if you look deeper, it's not actually that. Um, and it seems like Christian the Christianity seems to be one of the only things that has any kind of fixed sense of good and evil mm. at all. Like these other things either get rid of it or collapse them or go beyond good and evil such that there, it, it, it's either an illusion or it's both or something like that, rather than no, there is good and evil. And it, this is what good is. This is what evil is. And that's it. Mm. There doesn't seem to be much else like that that I've found. Certainly not that's in the public consciousness anyways. Well, so... Yeah, it, I guess it turns out that like beliefs have consequences too. It's like if, if people yeah. stop believing in good and evil, then like, the world changes. Like it's a very different world, um, which you also see, uh, which I saw in the Bay Area hippie scene too, like people really exploiting each other. Um, like people that were very into the deconstruction of good and evil and all those rejecting the traditional ideas, like just taking advantage of each other in various painful ways. Um, uh, yeah, ideas have consequences. But I would say that I think the um, all the Abrahamic religions have a concept of good and evil. Uh, oh, it, it is a it is a lineage, but and maybe just those. Like, I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, from what I know, like the pagan um, pre Christian, uh, you know, Greek and Roman religions, like, I don't think they had an idea of good and evil. They had an idea of like good and bad, like being good at something. Like, you know, you didn't want to be weak. You didn't want to lose a battle, but there, it maybe not be dishonorable. Um, maybe yeah, like, it was a code like of like honor, a... but, but there wasn't really the strong sense that like, uh, like the reason why you didn't want to offend the gods is because they might punish you. Not because there was any sort of like intrinsic evil. Um, yeah. And what is good, what is punishable or not punishable depends on which God you're serving at it at the given time. And the gods didn't always agree with each other. So, it, I mean, it does seem like you had some sort of sense of faith that like life was worth living, at least like you, even before you were coming to explicit Christianity, you're deciding that you're just not going to kill yourself. And then, um, and then finding and, and then looking for reasons to like, or, or looking for what, what, what supports you in that. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Um, I mean, we're probably one of the darkest times I had was this sort of, you know, existential sense that it's rational to kill yourself. 
you know, or it's better to like, it's the say, say, uh, Seder wisdom of um, like the like Pan or the God, God Pan. Uh, Nietzsche talks about it in Birth of Tragedy where, you know, it's better to better to not be born at all. And if you are born, better to die quickly, hmm. basically, like a sort of, you know, ref, refusing to accept life effectively. Um, and feeling that, oh, well, that makes sense. If nothing means anything and there's no meaning in suffering, uh, then, you know, whether or not life's worth living depends on how much you're suffering. And if you suffer enough, then, yeah, it becomes totally rational to kill yourself because mm -hmm. nothing means anything. And it doesn't matter if I live or die, you know, and that's a pretty scary place to be. And at bottom, it's just it's not livable, you know. And so I can't I, I mean, I would say at this point, it's by the grace of God that I didn't do that. Uh, mm -hmm and ultimately led me to, to where I am. So I don't, you know, I don't know by what other than the grace of God, I didn't decide to do that, you know, because from, from within that perspective, there's no way to get out of it without something else. Um, hmm. I mean, and that's kind of, I think a very rational description of the human, uh, of human life in general is um, like, there has to be something reaching him from without to provide meaning or provide order some way to orient yourself otherwise it is all kind of arbitrary um so like you know in christianity that's the revelation of god to man um and in an in individual life it can be i suppose uh an act of grace a calling um now uh how did you come across christianity and decide that that was the path that you wanted to go or that, that that was the right answer to the the place or the right response to the place that you found yourself in? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it is probably re reverberations of things that I had uh, read or learned either through my upbringing or even in, in school. Like I, I minored in religious studies in college, and so I was exposed to Christianity, among other things. Um, and I think <laughs> for the course of the past year, I couldn't help but think of um, the overall anti-worldly disposition of Christianity and the you know story of Revelation and, and stuff like that, like the book of Revelation or Apocalypse and seeing the patterns, I guess, and like, oh, well, this pattern matches. This is what the world is. And I, I got pretty deep into a lot of, um, let, let's say, uh, not mainstream materials, I guess, in looking at like, well, how, what is this going on? Because I can't, it, what people are saying they care about and what they're doing are not lining up. So what are, what's actually behind this? How can I understand what the motives are and try and, you know, reverse engineer, so to speak, or understand why these things are happening. And uh, through that process, it came, became, I guess, somewhat clear to me that this is a worldly disposition and rests on the assumption that this world is all that there is basically um and getting yours in this life is the ultimate aim of life and that's how this stuff is all operating and i, I think i just kind of started to intuit that that's not right and that christianity has always kind of rejected that idea um and i also was reading uh william blake at the time and uh oddly enough for his sort of Gnostic-ish or not or mystical, whatever. He, I mean, he has like the marriage of heaven and hell and uh, proverbs of hell and stuff like that. And like I was reading that, and I was like, oh, this is this is appealing and I, it's accurate insofar as that like that stuff is definitely consistent with what uh, the demons would say. But I didn't think about it like that. I was just like, oh, well, you know, let me try this out. This is some mystic stuff, you know. Um, and he has something what it's, it's called the everlasting gospel and he has like an account of jesus there which is in its own way kind of true um in uh he basically characterizes christ as rejecting rejecting the world fully and i forget the, the line or the couplet or whatever off the top of my head oh it's um humble toward god haughty haughty towards man something like that and that I, that resonated with me, I guess. And so that kind of, uh, I don't know, gave me a, something of a soft spot for uh, for Christ, which I always, I mean, I never really rejected 
Christ, that kind of rejected organized religion, or that's how I conceived of it to myself. Um, and so Christ seems to be this sort of paradigmatic rejection of the world. Um, and Nietzsche says as much, he just says it's bad, basically. And I was pretty steeped in Nietzsche. So so Christianity was always kind of like swirling around there in in the back, even if it was a something to, to be rejected. Um, and that kind of fits the fits the pattern of, well, it's Christianity versus the world. And that's the story that it, that it always has been. And even if you talk to the nihilists, it's the same thing. You know, Christianity is not in line with this worldly goals. We can't have communism, right? Or whatever, if we have Christianity, you can't have fascism. If you have Christianity, it's incompatible with all these sort of worldly utopian visions. Um, hmm. So it almost seems like I don't, I don't know where else I would have gotten to. <laughs> Uh, other than that, but yeah, so so I guess when you eliminate all the other possibilities as being some 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 uh, permutation of uh, this worldliness, um, you're you're sort of left with um, you have to have some orientation towards the transcendent God. Um, like it, it's either God or like you were saying, meaning meaninglessness, like self reference, um, and. Uh, so, so, uh, I guess Christianity, was there a particular like moment where, where you thought like, I am a Christian now, or I'm, or like, yes, this makes sense or something like that. Like, yeah. was, was there, was there a road to Damascus moment? Uh, uh, or... there was actually, yeah, okay. it's a, it was a, a subtle, well, not, or not so subtle. Like I, like I said, I was reading Blake, you know, I would read before I go to bed and, um, I have a dual edition of like the complete poetry of William Blake and John Don with the, that also included sermons of John Don. And, mm -hmm. um, he was a minister uh, in his later life, apparently, um, after, if I recall correctly, don't quote me on this. Like, you know, he was a, he was a more of a poet when he was younger. And then I guess got married, settled down and was ordained at some point, um, later on. And then that's what he was for the rest of his life. Something along those lines. I don't know if he stopped writing poetry, but it definitely changed in character, I think. But in any case, I, I had stumbled randomly open to a page of one of his sermons and I was like, oh, you know, let me read this. Um, and it spoke to where I was at then. It was like a sermon about Job and the book of Job um, and why, did, you know, why did evil happen and whatever, because I was thinking about that, like I was saying, you know, seeing this sort of evil in the world and the way the world's going. And it spoke to where I was at um, and I was very moved by it. And um, my mother had actually got me a devotional just because, you know, and I was like, well, let me check that what the day the, the thing is for today on there. And it was also about Job. And I was like uh, something in that moment uh, kind of clicked. Um, and I was just overcome, I, I would say, like with uh, with breath, for lack of a, a better word. And I started weeping and almost uh almost like dry heaving and it felt like something like left me uh mm. so to speak and in that moment it just i guess it was like oh this makes sense now <laughs> or, or you know christ on the cross makes sense uh wh whatever that means it was almost like it was just i didn't know exactly what that means it's like this is this is a true statement i and i don't know why and um in the wake of that i i was just you know asking myself i was like well am i a christian now like that's what it seems like just happened, but I don't understand it. And then from there, then I started to get more serious about understanding what had happened um, and what Christianity is. And that was, that's a, another longer story. Um, but in retrospect, after this event happened, I recalled a thought that I had had almost subconsciously a couple of days before where I had like sort of mused to myself, like if I were going to convert to Christianity, how would I do it? Because I did was like, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to I don't like organized stuff or whatever. And that's what I was thinking. And um, now I almost wonder, like, if that was a kind of prayer that was answered without me explicitly doing it that or thinking that I was praying. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. So that was kind of the moment where you'd. I guess you uh, uh, accepted Christ or or like, you know, you're saying he makes sense. So, so, so you kind of started considering yourself a Christian. 
it, yeah, I feel like uh, the way that I'm reading it at this point is like it was, you know, like they say, or at least some say that um, like faith is 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 a gift of God. It's not necessarily a choice that you make per se. And so uh, it's I wonder if that's what it was. Apparently, my uh, family member had been praying for me for some time who was Christian, you know, like, oh, you know, whatever. So, you know, who, who knows? It seems to me that it was like given to me. Like I didn't reach this by any kind of rational process. It was just a moment. And now. Well, now I believe in some basic sense that this is true. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I, you know, yeah. Well, that's that's encouraging to hear. Uh, I, I keep a prayer list of people in my life that I pray for, and um, one never knows uh, the power of prayer. Um, uh, but it also seems like this, you know, Christianity for you is a bit of a gift in that, like you were trained in the basic tenets of it growing up and have been sort of around it, uh, uh, at least in at least in somewhat um unusual forms maybe through some of these philosophers and artists that you were into i mean john donne i think is more of a mainstream christian uh i think he was uh he has belonged to some sort of uh, normal denomination if i'm not mistaken um yeah whereas william blake was more uh he's kind of uh colors outside the lines a little bit um yeah yeah uh, uh so i mean how have you um been trying to live into your Christianity uh, since since that experience. Um, mostly, I d doing a lot of reading. Um, I uh, I don't even remember how, but I started. Uh, I, I came upon Orthodoxy or Eastern Orthodoxy or whatever you want to call it. Um, and uh, uh, maybe I like I think I'm I started by just like looking at different things that I didn't know being raised Catholic. I looked at some of the, you know, like what's Lutheranism, what are the kind of uh, main Protestant things? And I had, you know, heard of orthodoxy. So I was like, well, what is that? And I started reading about it. And then I was like, oh, well, this fits my expectation for what I had always expected Christianity to be. And through experience felt like Catholicism, Roman Catholicism wasn't. Um, uh, particularly in that sort of intellectual disposition of Catholicism and trying to rationally know things that seem to be unknowable. It's my philosophical background. I basically came to the conclusion, which I think is correct, that one cannot know God rationally. And the attempt to do that is going to lead you to um, a tough a tough spot. And I think it ultimately leads a lot of people into atheism. If you start with the assumption that you can know God rationally and then discover that you can't, then you conclude that God doesn't exist. Mm. But I, that never made sense to me. And part of the whole trip down Gnosticism is was the sort of on the intuition that if there is some kind of divine spiritual something, you're not going to know it through a rational argument. It has to be through some kind of experience or revelation or, or something like that, but not through through reason. And that seems to be something that orthodoxy uh generally uh, has or the the, the or, well the admission that you can't know god ultimately but um what is known is um not through a rational dis discursive philosophical sort of sort of process and the, the way that you know that interprets um the Holy Spirit and stuff like that resonated a lot more with me and made a lot more sense um and as I read more and more into it it just yeah it, for a number of reasons it just uh, struck me as much much closer to what uh, i guess i was looking for you said you've you've read seraphim rose yeah i read um nihil his nihilism and the source of revolution uh and that really kind of put a lot of things to rest for me or because he he basically affirmed a lot of my intuitions uh and because i'd started to suspect that however one would can think of god it's impossible to have a, a coherent world with without some kind of fixed uh, unchanging you know something or other and uh you know in, in nihilism he talks about revolution as this sort of you know uh, rebel rebellion against god basically and nihilism is basically part and parcel of the rebellion 
against God that necessarily entails destroying order as such and denying uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's a very gross gloss and uh, probably not totally accurate. But um, I read that and the orthodoxy and um, religion of the future, which basically read back to me all the things that I was getting involved with from a completely different perspective that I didn't realize. Uh, and um, his orthodox survival course, which is pretty mind blowing, where he goes through sort of the history of Western thought, really. Uh, well, more than just Western thought, but there's significant stuff about the uh, Enlightenment and the Renaissance and the role of like the occult and Gnostic tendencies in all of that and the search for knowledge and the development of scientism, so to speak. This idea that we can uh, know our way into salvation if we just get more perfect knowledge and recreate the universe according to ourselves and all kinds of stuff, uh, stuff like that, which was very mind-blowing and it connected a lot of dots that I was never able to put together from a purely from my philosophical education some of this stuff never quite made sense to me as a project like the enlightenment project um, say didn't make sense it makes a lot more sense seeing it in the context or of um, uh, I guess a bigger spiritual sort of conflict than just as oh well you know we discovered that rationality is cool and we can like do whatever there's a lot of presuppositions built into there that we don't get taught even in philosophy school. Um, hmm. Yeah, so that, yeah, I've, I've read a lot of it. that's uh, that's that's fascinating. I haven't read any uh, Seraphim Rose myself. He just has a reputation, um, you know, in the community. I've read some other things, but uh, I, I think well, that, he like, speaks to the he speaks to this time. You know, he hmm. was uh, my understand. I think I he was a student of Alan Watts yeah. and an act of practicing Hindu. So he, you know, he had firsthand experience of this stuff and he speaks about it, you know, in an informed, competent and very precise way, not in a sort of um, like bombastic, Oh no, here come the big, bad, evil, mad magicians and Harry Potter sort of thing. It's like, no, here's, here's what this is in, in its own terms. And here's what it is from the standpoint of orthodoxy. And here's why it all fits, fits together. Yeah, I think I'm ready for him now. I don't think I was before. Like, I think I still had like too much attachment to my previous Buddhism. Um, so like, I didn't want to read someone that might be critical of it. But as I've come to understand, like, as much good as I think there is in Buddhism, like its fundamental worldview is not pointing towards the good. Um, like, if I can say that out loud, um, like that, that, you know, ultimately, we shouldn't be striving for non-existence like it doesn't that's not <laughs> that's not very appealing that's not what the good is um uh like if i can say that then i'm like i think i'm like ready for seraphim rose now where yeah i wasn't before yeah he's uh yeah he, he's he's challenging especially coming from from that like i've recommended uh him to some other people and like they've gotten through it but it, it's challenging because it's like the religion of the future thing like that's that's a reality, it seems to me. Like this, there's a sort of uh, milieu of sort of Hinduism, pantheism, spiritism, mediumism. That's all kind of has a lot of the same things going on, and our sort of general societal tendency seems to be towards that. Like people are despairing of materialism and find that it's not satisfying. There's something missing out of it, and so they're like, "Oh, I need some kind of spirituality," and then they go into to to this set of um, uh, this sort of uh, yeah conglomeration of of related ideas basically on the assumption that that you know God is dead and Christianity doesn't work mm. everybody this is a foregone conclusion and I didn't realize how much it was so for me until I started thinking about it more seriously like oh well God is dead obviously God is mm. dead we all know that Nietzsche said it it must be true you know mm. and you don't think about it anymore yeah if Nietzsche said uh, it it must be true pretty much mm. you know. He said it, 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 is, it, it is a background assumption. And, and I think like that's what this podcast right now is about is like, what if we question our assumptions, question everything, you know, which back in the 80s meant like throw away your parents' religion. But like today it might mean um, question uh, the assumption that you should throw out God. Um, like what if he was important? Uh, what if we need him <laughs> to live any sort of a decent life? Um, what if he's not dead? Yeah. <laughs> what, if, what, if, what if there is a true and living God? Um, 
by the name of Jesus, uh, that could be true. Uh, how does that change your life? And is, and if you try that on, like, do you like it better? Um, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of people find like nihilism ultimately unsatisfying. Uh, for me, I think, uh, you know, the pantheistic stuff was an escapism. Um, didn't really help. Uh, it didn't feel true. Um, I don't think I'm one with everything. I think I'm deeply interconnected with everything, but that's not the same thing as being one with everything. Um, and uh, like, I think there is a me. Um, so like in Christianity or in the, in the Orthodox idea, there's like a deep communion with God is possible. And, that, and, and that's the, um, and that's the, 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 the goal of, of humanity is to, to know God as intimately as we, as we can, which is completely in everything but his essence uh, through grace. But, um, but there is always that separation. I'm always me and God is always God. And I'm very grateful for that. I wouldn't want it any other way. You eliminate that distinction and I mean, you're just left in hell uh, or solipsism or, uh, and it's, it, it doesn't make sense anymore to me. Uh, that's my take on things. Um, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't. It, well, that's the kind of terrifying thing I think about um, the sort of like transcendental meditation, Eastern religion sort of thing of like dissolution. And um, there's a, there's a real wager going on there because uh, if you don't believe that there's, you know, heaven and hell, basically. If you don't believe in that, um, and, there, and that it's just nothing, I don't know. That's not very compelling. Like, you're just trying to die in, in some sense, assuming that death is just not existing, uh, whatever that means. But if, on the other hand, there is a spiritual reality, and death, true death isn't just, like, bodily death, but something else then it becomes uh it becomes a much bigger issue um i guess and i think that the inability of pantheism to deal with that or really to just kind of cover it over because having fooled around with that stuff i had distinct experiences especially at like concerts and stuff like this especially at jam band type concerts of this feeling of <laughs> things are superficially different. Like they're playing different notes and the songs are changing, but it's the same thing going on endlessly. And at a certain point in one particular show, I, I was just like, I, I want to leave. This is just the same thing over and over again. It's just party and party is like one substance that's just mm. continuous and non-differentiated. And then mm. I, you know, I get sick of it and it's like, well, thank God I'm still alive and I can just walk out the door and go somewhere else and do something else. But what if I had to be locked in here for this jam band show for all eternity? That was, you know, listening to effectively the same thing in infinite variations for forever. And it feels really hollow and empty. And it's a visceral feeling of like, oh my gosh, I feel sick. I need to go look at some trees or something. Like this is terrible. Um, and in retrospect, that's seen, I'm starting to think that that's what death is or like that's like in a certain sense a foretaste of what hell might be and i don't know because i'm i obviously don't have the spiritual discernment to be able to do that to make that assessment but um actually on the first time i went to uh an orthodox church afterwards after the service i walked out and nothing happened consciously i didn't know i walked out and everything was caught like calm and peaceful but in a sort of detached way that I had never experienced before. Um, and I, man, I feel terrible because I had actually finally managed to articulate what this, what this was uh, in better words. Um, so for, for, yeah, forgive me for that. But uh, I had a sense of permanence in that while at the same time, the world around me felt uh impermanent and it was very bittersweet of like oh this is this is good but temporary but i feel fixed and everything feels like there's an order to it and it i what stuck out to me is how it contrasted with that experience or mm -hmm. threw it into a stark relief of okay well i'm at this concert and it's the same sort of thing cycling over and over and over again forever just kind of churning effectively and then i had this in contrast, a feeling of like just being fixed and the world around me, you know, changing, but ultimately being 
um, still still having a sense of uh, having internally a sense of permanence. It's very, it's kind of difficult to describe, but it was like very different sort of feeling of I feel fixed within a world of change versus I'm just being churned about in this sort of endless um, cycle or something like that. Yeah, it's really profound to think about that contrast um, because like at the liturgy every Sunday, like we do do the same thing every Sunday, but somehow like that feels good. Whereas going to your, your like 13th jam band concert of the year feels hollow or like it stops satisfying. Um, and like, what's the difference there between why does, why do I go to liturgy every week and feel good about it? Um, but like for me, the jam band equivalent is something like, yeah, party as this undifferentiated substance. Uh, it was probably like Burning Man. Um, it's like, you know, I mean, I'm not that excited to go to Burning Man ever again. I mean, I'm not saying I, I like completely reject all parties, but in general, like parties are not satisfying. Party is no longer satisfying to me. And like, what's the difference there? And it's something to do with like God or not God. And like maybe anything experienced eternally, like when you're imagining eternal jam band, like that being hell. And I think anything experienced eternally other than God uh, would be hell. Um, that's yeah that's my impression um it seems well the, one of the things with the liturgy in contrast to say a jam band is that everything in it has has meaning and it's you know there's a definite structure and, and form to it that is you know ever consistent and every if you remove any of the elements it changes the whole whereas at you know a jam band concert that's not so it's arbitrary which notes are played are arbitrary and part of the point of it is well i didn't see just this particular time this time it's slightly different than last time but it's still kind of the same but it's different but there's no the difference isn't meaningful mm -hmm. it's like superficially different um and without it, like the the and the internal structure seem to be kind of uh, it's inherently meaningless because they're just sounds <laughs> <laughs> they're just sounds without any meaning and this is maybe where language comes in you know because the liturgy has you know can have music but um there's words that mean things it's poetry yeah really um like for me like the liturgy and, and it's also um prayer uh and um like for me like the liturgy different parts speak to me different weeks like like it is this active conversation between myself and god um where where i am being spoken to like through the liturgy um and i'm relating to god through it and uh yeah it's it's i never haven't got tired of it yet <laughs> i haven't got tired of it yet i don't i don't think i will um but uh yeah it's it's, it's very different um oh actually I, you mentioned it. it seemed like there's a direction like in, in prayer like that you're you know you're directing it towards towards god um but that direction seems significant like if you go to a concert you're not directing yourself towards anything like mm -hmm. and the people that are playing aren't really directing it either they're kind of just doing it it's mm -hmm. just an event that happens that hasn't it's not directed towards anything whether that's god or anything else it's just kind of for its own sake yeah and yeah and you especially get that feeling at a jam band yeah, that's why I picked that out in particular because yeah. they really drive that home because you can hear the same song a bajillion times or well, or hear three different songs that are different songs that all sound the same and that gets kind of unnerving. Well, <laughs> so. I, I, I do like this idea of like party as being like a single substance. And I think it's like when you get tired of party, that is certainly like I saw, um, I was 35 when I, I, I broke up with a, a long-term girlfriend and like I was seeing like guys who are 45 and 50, like at these parties, like trying to pick up chicks. And I'm like, I, is that what I want to be doing when I'm, when I'm 45 or 50? Like, do I want, and it was it's horrifying to me. Like, I don't want, yeah. like party is not my life. Um, like there's a limit to how much party can satisfy me. In fact, it, and now, um, as I'm getting towards 40, it's, uh, it doesn't satisfy me much at all. Like I, I have to, like I only enjoy party if it's in like a in a matrix of meaning, like with uh, celebrating something important or um, really relating to my friends that I love. Um, it's really lost its flavor. 
Uh, and I think that when that when party loses its flavors, when people fail out of the the, the neo hippie scene, I think. Yeah, I mean that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of the point that I reached to realize. Yeah, it's not it's not fulfilling. It goes nowhere, and um, you, you know, you kind of, I kind of started to feel beholden to it, both to like mm -hmm. the drugs and to the you know alcohol and you know whatever else you. And then this sort of, oh, you know, am I going to, you know, go, am I going to get laid? You know, I'm like, what am I here for? It's like this sort of endless cycle of consuming the same substances repeatedly, doing the same things often enough, depending on who you hang out with, hearing the same music over and over again, and then seeking what is ultimately a very diminished form, I think, of sexuality, even um, such that you can. You, you you just have these sort of interchangeable people effectively like it doesn't matter which one you know you could find anyone at the party and that if it just works out in a the moment then that's fine and that kind of flattens that experience and makes it not meaningful and that definitely loses its its flavor after a while and then you know now i kind of am seeing it very differently like oh well you know how much of that was freedom and how much of that is me being enslaved to my own desires and being led around <clears throat> by various impulses rather than actually choosing anything. Well, but, um, you know, we're coming up on the end of like the time that I said we would take and, uh, it's been very delightful, John, uh, very happy to have you here. Um, I, I don't know if you would feel comfortable. I don't know if you'd have any, um, like what, what, what advice would you give to someone in their twenties, maybe like, going on their own spiritual journey like turning through different worldviews like uh i don't know is there anything that you'd say to like a younger version of yourself Whew. um <laughs> beware i guess test mm. the uh test the uh spirits i guess see where things are coming from try and see uh look at Look at all the perspectives and don't take things as foregone conclusions based on what um, society might tell you and say, like, oh, well, this religion can't be whatever because it's over. I mean, that was the biggest thing for me is this sort of underlying atheist assumption and uh, that, you know, there is no God. God is impossible and materialism and all this sort of other stuff that's just kind of in the background milieu that we don't even think about. And a lot of this stuff, I'm still uncovering uh, assumptions that I have that I don't know that I have. Um, and so, I mean, really kind of just quite question things more, especially if, if, <laughs> if it's, if everybody's doing it and it's the main thing that everybody's doing and it's on every TV and on every social media and whatever, at the very least question it, if not just go a completely different way, because if everybody's doing the same thing and believing the same thing and not. Yeah, I don't know. I've always been skeptical of that sort of stuff and uh, try and examine what what about those things you might be accepting for granted without realizing it, which is kind of hard if you're if you're in it. So it's kind of expose yourself to stuff that uh, contradicts what you think. I mean, really hmm. challenge yourself. Like question everything. But for real. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like actually breaks. Take breaks. Don't question everything all the time because that leads to despair. But uh, you have a cup of tea sometimes. Yeah, and see your friends and family. And uh, well, uh, let's let's call it there, John. I appreciate your time. It's a great conversation. I hope people enjoy this. And thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me.